Well, thank you. Um, you know, I've, I've never spoken to so many architects in my life, I think. <laughs> I've, I've always wondered what architects look like. And I was trying to think while you were talking what they might look like. I remembered a, a, a film I had seen about how the pyramids were built. And many of those chaps, you know, I mean, there is a certain similarity. I can sense it. <laughs> so, but it's, it's very nice to be here. I hope what I'm going to talk about makes sense to you uh, in the context of your subject, hopefully, um, as well as in the context of society and children. Um, so I, have to, uh, I want to build up an argument which actually has four statements in it. And at the end of it, if, if you agree with the four statements, then uh, you might decide that, that there is a certain alternative way to look at education, particularly the education of uh, children, primary education or elementary education, as they call it in the United States. Well, the, first, the first little bit is about remoteness and the quality of education. Um, I started with an experiment about two years ago out of, uh, out of New Delhi. Uh, by, by working with Google Earth, you can figure out routes out of New Delhi which avoid all the main metropolitan and urban areas. So you purposely avoid those, and you head deeper and deeper into the country. And as you do that, I mean, I actually rented a car and drove down all of these roads. And wherever we saw a, a primary school, we would stop. And I would give the children a test of English, math, and science, a standard government test. And then we drove back to Delhi, totaled all those marks up, and plotted it against the distance from New Delhi. And this is what we got. Now. It's an interesting result. It's pretty significant. And it's a downward curve. The question is, why does education in rural India get worse as you go further and further away from the city? Um, are the children different? Well, statistically, from whatever data I could get, the children are no different. These are 6 to 12-year-olds, and they're absolutely identical. The schools are all built by the government, so they have the same amount of funding, they have the same design, they have the same size classrooms, etc. They have the same number of teachers. So I couldn't actually get any correlation of why the results drop like that as you go further away, except for one question which we asked uh, in each school. We asked the teachers, would you like to work somewhere else? And this is what we got. The upward bars are yes, the downward bars are no. So as you, as you step out of Delhi, you come, uh, you come to the, the rich suburbs of Delhi, which are you know, very nice areas, and all the teachers say, no, we don't want to go anywhere else. Then you go a little bit further away, and the teachers say, yeah, we would like to change to a school over here. So we don't like it over there. This is an anomaly. About 100 kilometers outside of Delhi are the, are the call centers. You know, when you get your calls selling you new credit cards or when you get tortured by BT, it's all coming from here. <laughs> okay. They are very rich. They live according to uh, American and British time. So they wake up late in the evening. They read British newspapers. They watch British TV and so on. And they speak to you on the phone. Um, the teachers in these areas said, we don't want to go anywhere else. This is, this is quite cool. Then about 200 kilometers outside of Delhi, the answers all changed to no. Now, that correlated well with my curve. What it really said was that if you have a teacher standing in front of a, a, a class full of young children and thinking to herself, and it's usually a, a she, she is thinking to herself, I wish I was somewhere else, somehow that seems to make the children perform worse. It's a, it's a kind of a qualitative thing, but there it was. 
Around that time, I moved to England, which is a story I'll tell you a little bit further down the line. But when I moved to England, I thought, well, now here is a country where I won't get a similar problem because the more remote areas will not necessarily have worse facilities than the built-up areas. So everything will be uh, nice. And, it's, uh, and chances are that teachers who work in remote areas in England or uh, in the UK will also say, uh, we will not say that we want to move anywhere else. They'll say we are quite happy here. And indeed, when I looked at similar figures, there was no correlation with geography. But then I looked at all the primary school results in northeastern England and found that not all the schools are doing equally well. There are good schools and bad schools. So why is there a difference at all? I started looking for a correlation, and I got one almost straight away. These are GCSE performances on that axis, on, on the y-axis. The x-axis is the density of council housing in the Northeast. And it was a fairly significant and tight correlation. I'm doing that now for the rest of England, and most of the time you find it's the same. So then I chose these areas, which has 40% or more uh, council housing density, which means that four out of 10 houses are council houses. And I went there. It was an interesting experience, because the moment I said I want to go there, most people in the university said, well, don't. So, <laughs> but I did, and I went to a couple of these areas. I spoke to the teachers there without telling them what my agenda was, and I asked them, Is this, have you ever thought of working in another school? And they all said yes. They said, it's very dangerous over here. It's very dirty. We don't like living over here. We would like to go somewhere else. So we had the same thing. And then I realized that I need to define, redefine the word remote, not only in terms of geography, but in terms of other factors. This was socioeconomic remoteness. I'm looking at American data. And in America, you get similar definitions of remoteness, but those are cultural definitions, ethnic remoteness religious remoteness. So you can have remoteness in many forms. But let me put it in a simple statement. There are and always will be places in the world where, for whatever reason, good schools don't exist and good teachers don't want to go. I think we don't really need to do research to find that out. It's kind of self-evident that such areas exist and will continue to exist. The question is, what do we do there then? And I turned to my well, th this is that statement that schools in remote areas don't have good enough teachers, they can't retain teachers, they don't have infrastructure, they can't maintain the infrastructure. So what do we do? I turned to my subject, which is educational technology, and discovered that the literature says that it is utterly useless. If you read the literature on educational technology, what is educational technology? Well, what we are using over here, which is PowerPoint, a Japanese projector made in China, a, a laptop, Microsoft PowerPoint. This is there in every classroom in most universities. Now, none of this was built for education, if you think about it. Microsoft didn't write PowerPoint for educators. They wrote PowerPoint for boardroom presentations. These projectors were not invented for education. They were invented for boardroom presentations. The laptop was not invented for teachers. It was invented for corporate executives. Hence, the pricing is all corporate. Teachers borrow this technology and pay the corporate prices for it. So then, where will it go first? It is always traditionally piloted in affluent urban schools. But the affluent urban schools, as we saw from my remoteness experiment, already has good teachers and good students. So what is the result? It is perceived to be overhyped and underperforming. And that's what the literature says. So typically, they'll say, a mathematics teacher bought a whiteboard, an intelligent whiteboard for his class. The end result, the students performed a little bit worse than they did before, so, <laughs> because they got distracted by the whiteboard or whatever. So then I thought, 
how about this as a sentence that educational technology should reach the underprivileged first and not the other way about and that if we did improvements at the bottom of the scale then we might get proportionately higher results and that's what the work of my work of last 10 years is about so now if you talk about alternative education systems to to teachers and to educationists they don't actually want to hear about it so i had to make a statement which is acceptable to the official education line and i said that you need an alternative primary education where schools don't exist now that's pretty non controversial because if the school doesn't exist then you know you do need an alternative you could still say well we'll build a school to which i'll say that it is a little bit difficult to build a primary school at this point in time in let's say tora bora but there are children growing up there so what do we do do we allow them to grow up without an education which will aggravate the problem that we were trying to solve in tora bora in the first place so we need an alternative over there so then i we'll talk about a set of experiments the first one was done almost 10 years ago and it was done in an area in new delhi called kalkaji which is in the southeastern side of new delhi um, which is a um, is an industrial come impoverished sort of area it's a combination of the two things and i had an office there a very plush software development facility which was a, a, a large building with a boundary wall around it and just outside the boundary wall there was a slum a big sprawling urban slum what i did was i made a, a rectangular opening in the wall which is when the experiment got called the hole in the wall put a glass pane against that put a pentium against the glass pane put it on high bandwidth internet with in those days altavista.com on its screen buried a touch pad into the wall so now if you're standing on the slum side of the wall you see this stretch of dirty wall with a blue glowing rectangle with altavista.com on it and i turned it on and left it there and i asked a colleague of mine to stand behind actually he, he was a couple of feet off the ground on a tree with a, with a video camera this is what we got after about 8 hours that's my office in the back and this is the hole in the wall after 8 hours we got this footage on the right is an 8 year old boy to his left is a student who is a 6 year old girl and she is a bit short for the computer but what he was doing was quite amazing he was teaching her to browse now that raised a lot of very interesting questions firstly is this real does language matter because they are not supposed to know any english so how was he actually tackling the language will the my boss ask this question will the computer last or will it just get broken up and, and and stolen and finally did anyone teach them and people thought that it was a simple explanation on the other side of the wall were all these young software developers so it's quite possible that the children just sort of leant over the wall and called some of them and said can you tell us what to do and somebody showed them how to use the mouse could have been the explanation but i wanted to check that further so i took the experiment out of delhi i took it to a small city called shivpuri in the center of uh, almost the geometrical center of india uh, where i was assured that nobody had taught anybody anything for a long time so we didn't have this danger of you know someone coming and teaching them how to how to browse so i buried my computer in the wall over there this time i sort of parked my car across the road somewhere over here uh, many yards away with a zoom lens and i wanted to catch the action the, when it first happens and we did actually get it 
I edited this a bit to put a, I added a cow because when you show these things outside India, you have to show a cow. <laughs> it was a warm day in the middle of the afternoon. Here's the little boy who first came there. He's about 13 or 14 years old, his school dropout. So he came there and he started fiddling with the touchpad. Noticed very quickly that his finger movements on the touchpad was moving the cursor on the screen. So this got his attention and he sort of got a little more interested. And as he was playing with the cursor, he made an accidental click and the Internet Explorer changed page. When that happened, you can see him look from his hand to the screen and make the connection. We'll watch that. There. That, to my mind, was a jump of 5,000 years in about a second. <laughs> and eight minutes later, he was browsing. He wasn't doing anything technologically wonderful, but he was going from one website to another, and he was able to come back. He knew that the arrow changes to a hand shape, and you have to click. Now, like any other child, he then started calling all the neighborhood children. By the end of the evening, 70 children were browsing. So I concluded that this could, I mean, I didn't conclude, I just made this into a research question at that time, that groups of children can self-instruct themselves to use a computer and the internet. The question is, what kind of children and under what circumstances? At this point, there was another objection to these experiments, which was the use of the English language. And people said, you're making it unnecessarily hard. Because not only are you confronting the children with an unknown machine, but, you, but in a language that they don't understand. So how would you expect them to progress? So I thought, OK, let me try a null experiment. Let me take it to an area where they don't know any English at all. And let me show that they will actually not be able to make progress. So I took it to a village called Madan Tusi. This is in North India, uh, northeastern India, where for reasons that I had spoken of earlier, no English teacher had actually existed. So the children didn't know any English. And I put in a computer in their school. This was 30th of June, year 2000. It's an animal rearing uh, kind of community there. The children flocked around the computer the moment I put it in. The adults uh, showed very little interest. The adult men didn't show any interest at all. They walked off, as you will see them walking off. The women sat under trees far away just to keep an eye on the children. I came back after three months, having left it there. Well, since most of you will not understand the language, I'll tell you what happened. When I went back after three months, I found this eight-year-old boy and a 12-year-old girl, and they were playing a Microsoft game. And when they saw me, the first thing they said was, we need a faster processor and a better mouse. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, asked them how they had come to that conclusion. And they gave a very simple answer, very interesting answer to me as an educator. They said that, if you give us a machine which works only in a language that we don't know, then we have to teach ourselves the language. Now, this is very different from what adults would say. If your course in architecture was in uh, Swahili, you would have said, I can't learn architecture because I don't know the language. Two negatives. The children say, we can learn a computer by learning the language first. So they taught themselves, and I measured it, 500 or 400 English words with each other in the correct sense that they were using in their regular conversation and pronouncing it in a distinctly Southern American drawl, which they picked off the internet or from CDs or wherever. So it seemed to show that language is not a barrier, but that they may actually teach themselves a language. So at this time, I got some funding from the World Bank. And I needed it because we needed to show that these were not one-offs, but that 
what we had seen in these three experiments were actually replicable and, and a general phenomenon. So I repeated this in 23 villages in India. Uh, it took about four years to do it, and it should take you about four minutes to see it. We started uh, up in the north, in the Himalayas. Uh, I should explain to you what the, what the logic is. I, I had to do two things. One is I had to measure the effects on children and to see if children would teach themselves the same way everywhere. The second one was an interesting engineering problem. These feces are to be kept outdoors. So I needed to know what do I have to do to a regular office computer in order that it works outdoors. These machines are not meant to be kept outdoors. If you put one of these outside Madame Tussauds or something, it will last for 15 minutes before something or the other goes wrong or the machine itself disappears. So what does one have to do? Uh, I, I talked to a lot of architects at that time, I talked to many people, and we did evolve a design as you'll see. In order to test it, test this hypothesis, India is a good place because it has all the ethical, uh, the, the ethnic, uh, geographical, uh, racial, and genetic characteristics that, were, uh, that exist in the world. So if you look right up north, are the white Caucasians, leftovers of Alexander. If you look right down south, you have the Negroids, the first people from Africa who, who actually came in, God knows when. If you look at the west, are the Persians. And if you look at the east, are the Chinese and the uh, Far East. So, so you have all the communities there. You have from the extremely rich to the extremely poor. So, so choosing a sample was not difficult. And in order to study the the engineering aspects, also India is a good place because you have all the climates, from the very cold to the very hot to the very humid and so on. So where, where we're looking, where you just saw ahead where those girls were singing was up in Ladakh, 19,000 feet above the sea level where the temperatures dropped to minus 50 degrees centigrade. Um, a semiconductor stop at minus 50. So, so we have to figure out a couple of things to keep the, the chips a little warmer than uh, ambient. Uh, this area here, Sorry. This is the duck, the cold desert. And down to the foothill of the, the foothills of the Himalayas, this is at about 6,000 feet above sea level. This is cold, damp, and deciduous, the same weather as uh, UK, uh, most of the year round. And to the western desert, very hot near the Pakistan border, with fine sand which blows across the keyboards and mice. Then to uh, central and coastal India, which is hot, humid, and tropical with corrosive uh, ocean air, sea air. These are fishing villages, mostly Christian. This is an interesting sequence. You see this eight-year-old boy telling his elder sister what to do. And this is quite common in the hole in the wall, that the younger children know more than the older ones do. This is down into the heart of uh, Hindu southern India. And uh, the reason why I had those language clips is actually for Indian audiences, because uh, the languages change as you go down the subcontinent, from uh, Arabic up in the north to Sanskrit in the south, Persian in the west and Chinese in the east. 
And uh, if you if you are an Indian, you can you hear the difference. <laughs> I was putting beef sack at this time, and these children get to a live cricket match. This is the Eastern River Delta, the Ganges Delta. <laughs> By this time, there was interest from many other countries. How do you play? Here are little sequences from South Africa. And Cambodia. So that was the, the main experiment and this is what we found that 6 to 13 year olds can self instruct in a connected environment irrespective of anything that we could measure, educational background, literacy levels, social, economic levels, ethnicity, gender, genetics, geography and even intelligence. It didn't correlate with anything at all. You give a computer to a group of children, they attain the same level of proficiency over the same period of time. It has to be a computer given to them in a public location and they have to work in groups. These are the conditions under which this will happen. We also got an engineering design for putting computers into public spaces without air conditioning and with very poor power. And there were a lot of fairly interesting things that we had to do. You see over there, at the back of the wall there is an exhaust fan, except that it's upside down. When I put the exhaust fan the right way, it would blow air out of the room, so it blows the heat out fine, except that it also sucks in air from every crevice and every orifice there is. So the inside of the chamber becomes completely dusty after a certain amount of time. What I did was I bought powerful blowers and turned them back backwards so that they would blow air inside so that the enclosure is under positive pressure. So wherever there is a crack, there's air spilling out. Heat is not as much of a problem as humidity and dust and that method prevented uh, humidity and dust from causing the damage. There are several related experiments that I won't talk about but I will talk a little bit about the technology. This is what we finally came to. It's a long, uh, a longish, a very narrow kind of a hut in the walls of which you have the computers embedded. Uh, over every computer there's a lid and when you open the lid it's at a height such that if you're over a certain height you need to bend at an awkward angle to see the screen. In front is a, a seating rod and that seating rod is placed at a distance from the wall such that if you're over a certain height when you try to sit on it your legs will splay. The keyboard is covered with a cowl, a plastic cowl which keeps dust out and has an opening in it through which, which is calculated such that only small hands will go in. So using these methods it's possible to create a structure which you don't have to say is for children but is obvious that it is because everybody else finds it difficult to use. Um, a problem here is of keeping the adults out, particularly the 18 to 24 year olds out of that, not for any reason other than the fact that they will not allow the children to access it. So how do you keep them out? Well, this design feature did a lot of that. The other factor is that uh, putting a sign up on top saying all activity at this kiosk is monitored from New Delhi has an electrifying effect, whether you monitor it or not. <laughs> but we did monitor it. We had uh, 
uh, so this is the enclosure. There's a web camera there. Uh, there are environment sensors which senses the humidity, uh, dust, and temperature levels and can feed it back to New Delhi on demand. So I could actually sit in my office in Delhi and find out what sort of environmental conditions exist inside. There's a lot of rich information in just getting those three numbers. If you see the humidity in a particular place rise and start to reach almost 100%, you know that there's probably raining and there's probably a leak somewhere uh, inside the enclosure. So then you can turn the computers off remotely before they actually get damaged. Um, there is power conditioning and four hours of power storage. Uh, so you take uh, the power in all these places is terrible. So I used to take that uh, AC power, convert it to DC, store it, and then reconvert and process my own power, which I would feed to the computers. Connection was through VSAT uh, broadband. I would strongly suggest uh, uh, that you don't use this because if you ever had to, because it's terrible. It's very expensive, and, it, and the bandwidth is awful. We have three kinds of software. There's remote monitoring, through which I can see what's happening, as you see just now. We have a piece of software called Safe Desktop, so that if the children accidentally delete things on the desktop, when the damage is over a certain percentage, the system rolls back to whatever it was on day one. And there's something called Anti-Hang, which is a piece of hardware, which looks at the current profiles inside the machine. And when it sees the same repetitive current profiles in the hard disk and the CPU, it comes to the conclusion that the machine is hanging and reboots it on its own. Because the children don't have access to the back of the machine to press the reset button. There are six kinds of sensors, cameras, mics, light sensors, heat sensors, humidity, and software sensors. There's a complete log which is maintained on each machine, which is fed back into a website. So sitting in my office, I can actually see, not exactly in real time, but a few minutes behind, I can see what's happening on the screen of each of these, of any of these machines. Um, this particular shot is interesting because of this village here, a very remote place uh, somewhere in uh, northeastern India, where a little girl, I think she must have been not more than nine years old, had discovered the web camera, had figured out what software triggers it, and was using it to take photographs of herself. I can also get the faces of the children. So there was, you know, there's sort of gigabytes of data from these four years. Uh, and it, it's not been deciphered yet, all of it. It's like a detective uh, novel. You, you look at the system log, you look at the screenshots, you look at the children's faces, and you try to correlate which child was doing what. This is what we came to as a conclusion, that, that this technology, which is corporate boardroom technology, will only take us so far. We teachers have our own specifications. These are the specifications. We need digital, automatic, fault-tolerant, minimally invasive, connected, and self-organized educational systems. The bad news is no one knows how to build it. They know how to build the corporate stuff, but they don't know how to build this. So we have to wait, but at least we have the specs now. And we need this technology for those who need it the most. We don't need this in urban schools. Urban schools already have good teachers, but we need it down there. Well, let me take you out of this into something somewhat different. What was this method telling us? It was telling us that you can't make education happen. Education is not architecture. You could take a, a piece of land, and you could make a building happen. You could have a plan, you could have a budget, and you could create something which is exactly what you wanted to. However, if you had another piece of land where you wanted to grow an apple tree, and the specification said that on the third branch of the apple tree, apple tree in the sixth month, there must be two ripe apples, there's no way to do that. Right? 
you can put the seed, you can put the fertilizers, but you can't go very, far, very much beyond that. You, you can't say every leaf has to be double glazed. It will be the way it will be. So what's the difference between these two methods? A tree is also a complicated structure, so is a building. But one depended on the management style of making things happen. The other depends on the management style of letting things happen. And I think education falls under this heading, not the other one. And often enough, the problems with education are when you try to force it into the making things happen way. Here's a little sequence from a village called Agastiswaram. When we went there, there was only one little girl thing on the computer. You can see her just now. There she is with a natural tone. She lifts bricks for a living. And every time she finishes lifting one batch of bricks, she comes running to the computer and starts playing with it. And she's very good. The boys hate her because they say that she spoils the computer. What she actually does, which I discovered, was that she has a favorite game. She comes and renames the DLL of that game in the Windows system directory so that the game doesn't work. When all the boys go away, she renames it back and then continues to play with it. <laughs> You'll see we have to reinvent the mouse there. It's a Six button solid state mouse. Sometimes she lets the boys use the computer. So we are assembling a video camera. Okay, so, um, so, so what? What happens next after this? Let me take you to another piece. And I promise that we are very close to the end. So just to reiterate my argument, there are and always will be places where good schools don't exist. Where good schools can't exist, we need an alternative to schooling. The last bit is, can the internet bring teachers to where they don't want to go or where they cannot go? So this is what I'm working on at the moment, a subject which doesn't exist so far, but we wanted to call it instructional robotics. And it deals with an important issue, an important issue for almost everybody, presence. What is it about a teacher standing in front of a class that's different from written material, audio material, visual material, video conferencing, chatting, etc., etc.? Why is it different? Why do people always say, well, it's not like the real thing, the real thing being a real person in front of a real class. 
Well, I did a very quick thought experiment. This is a school in Hyderabad, a slum school in Hyderabad. And there is a teacher, and as we saw, a reluctant teacher sitting and teaching that class. I thought to myself, what would happen if that teacher could be replaced by a three-dimensional hologram? You know, just imagine for a moment that it was possible. I mean, suppose, how, how do you know that I'm here? You're not touching me, so you don't know. And uh, hopefully you're not smelling me. So how do you know that I'm not a three-dimensional hologram? You would need to put your hand through me to figure out, isn't it? The only problem is it can't be done right now. I mean, it can be done in labs, but it can't be done in real life. I think it will take up to 2030 AD to actually make that happen. If that happens, then we don't, really don't care. I mean, I don't need to come here from Newcastle. I just send my hologram. But what I can do right now is I can replace the teacher with a two-dimensional screen. How will that go? Well, these are some specs that I won't talk about, but I will take you out of this to how it actually does work. Um, this is what we tried very recently from Newcastle to Hyderabad. Is 
So you've got love. What's what's the name of your teacher? Uh, and we tried it several times between UK, India, Argentina. It's free. It holds all right, but it says a couple of things about presence. That experiment worked fine, but later what I did was I projected that screen onto a wall so that Pauline would be her actual life size. And that made a huge difference to the whole thing. So what I'm setting up now in Newcastle is a little room from where you can you can teach anywhere in the world in life size. One wall of the room is somewhat like this. So I have my my whiteboard here. I'm standing here. Over there is my class in life size. So I, I see them as I see you. So you can raise your hand and I can point to you and so on. They see me as one of their walls. Inside the room, what I haven't done so far, but I intend. Okay, this works fine. You saw that experiment. There was one problem, which is that Pauline was full of energy because it was a bright, sunny Newcastle day. A bright, sunny, warm Newcastle day, which is like eight degrees. <laughs> Those children were at 35 degrees at 80 percent humidity. Now she had no way to figure that out. That their energy levels would be different. What I'm going to do next is that the little room that I'm constructing in Newcastle will have a humidifier, an air conditioner, and a room heater. I'll take the environment data from the other side and recreate Hyderabad in, inside that room so that then Pauline can sweat it out along with the children. <laughs> and, and that, I think, is very important to what presence is all about. Presence is sharing the environment. I don't know what we exchange when we are physically present, but there's something that we exchange which is beyond the visual image. And that's what I'm trying to get to. One last bit. What about the Northeast? You know, I've done all these experiments in extraordinarily exotic places in India, Africa, Cambodia. And I came to one of my most exotic places, which was Gateshead, Newcastle, to do one more experiment. And what I did there was I, I took a, a group of eight-year-olds, uh, actually eight groups of four eight-year-olds, uh, ten-year-olds, gave them six GCSE questions, told them to share one computer and figure out the answers, which they did in about 20 minutes flat, everything correct. Then I asked them, if you all had a computer, which they do, how long would it have taken? And I don't have the time to show you the vi video. They said, never. We wouldn't have been able to figure it out. So remember, it's the groups which does it. it it's, it's the discussion in the group that allows them to explore much further than if you confront a single child with a computer and give them a task. Then they're just scared. So we did that in Gateshead. I also did a study of aspirations in the Northeast, and discovered to my horror that all the little boys want to become footballers, and all the little girls want to become models. So I couldn't quite figure out. There were one or two exceptions. I got my first clues from there. One girl said, I want to be a teacher. And I said, why? And she said, because my mom's a teacher. But the others did not. Remember, that's the, the, the old coal belt uh, over there. There's a lot of bitterness amongst a certain segment of that society. So they don't get any particular encouragement from the family. But then what's the school for? Why are they? What's this with football? When I investigated further, the answer is very simple. In order to aspire, you need a role model. The media provides the role model for these children. And unfortunately, the media's idea of role modeling are TV stars, football stars, models, fashion designers, and so on. So they don't actually know what else there might be. So I started an experiment in an area called Long Benton. And it's going on right now. What we do is take groups of children, again in groups, and show them TED Talks. They form their own groups. Group 
when they research what they saw basically the research what they what they just seen and, and present to the lads each other started talking who says to me i want to be a primatologist because he's seen a ted talk on bonobo monkeys and he thought it was very cool to study them so but you see what i mean that they didn't know that these professions existed so instead of simply blaming that generation and blaming their parents if if we just could present to them um role models and allow them to work in the hole in the wall model which is allow them to to group together and work on it it may be the simplest possible solution to causing a change in aspiration which is the reason why i titled this talk out doctrination i'll i'll leave you with that thought that indoctrination what is indoctrination doctrine and dogma are imposed from the outside you can't you can't learn a doctrine on your own a doctrine is imposed upon you or a dogma is imposed upon you but values are acquired you can't impose a value it's just the opposite you have to acquire it so if you enable groups of children to have independence over the internet so that they can confront differing points of view and decide for themselves what they think is right or wrong then maybe we would have taught them to prevent indoctrination it needs a lot of study to figure that out but if we can if we have vaccinated them against indoctrination then the word i wanted to use was we have outdoctrinated them if we outdoctrinate them i would figure that for whatever investment it takes it would have very long term effects i tried to work out the economics of the hole in the wall it works out to 3 us cents 1 and 1/2 p per child per day so it's a very simple calculation if you want to do it to 2 billion children which are all the children on earth you need about 3 to 5 years time and you need 180 billion dollars it used to be a very large amount of money till the banks crashed and we realized that even 700 billion dollars is nothing so 180 billion dollars is really nothing and uh, in 3 years i would figure that you could actually outdoctrinate the whole world I, i mean don't look at me as, as a fanatic but, but but look i mean we have to do something about it isn't it i mean what we are doing instead is equally ridiculous i will give you some examples we are going to throw all young people who carry knives into jail we are going to take away 
nail scissors from 80 year old ladies at airports. Is that going to stop all this? Or rather, if we were to, to, to strike the problem at the 8 to 8, 12 year olds, I propose that we'll get the best bang for the buck. And that's it, thanks. <laughs>